Releasing Trauma is sponsored by the Global Association for Trauma Recovery. The Global Association for Trauma Recovery is a social impact organization serving as a resource for survivors and their families dedicated to facilitating change by spreading trauma-related awareness and thus creating a more trauma-informed world. Learn more at gaftr.org. Welcome to Releasing Trauma, a Survivor's Podcast. I am your host, Tracy Osborne. I am a survivor of emotional bullying, rape, sexual assault, domestic abuse, and grief. After losing my husband in 2019, I set off on a new adventure to help other women release their trauma and create a life they can cherish. Each week, I will feature a guest expert or a survivor to share their stories, tips, wisdom, and more. The goal? is so that you can take away even just the smallest nugget of information you can use in your life right now to make a change and to remind you that you're not alone. There is life after trauma and you can move from victim to thriver and create a life you can cherish. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. I am your host, Tracy Osborne. With me today is Ed Hajim and we are going to be talking about overcoming adversity. Now, I want you to know you all are my guinea pigs today because I am playing with a brand new microphone and I spent the last two hours before recording this podcast episode playing with the settings and getting it all hopefully perfect. So um, y'all have to let me know how how it sounds. Um, Ed, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you here. Nice to be on here. Well, you know, it's we've had to reschedule a couple times, so I appreciate you putting up with my uh, my calendar craziness. Um, you know, I'd like to definitely start out with hearing a little bit about your backstory, and then I can't wait to hear about your book on the road less traveled. Well, it's a I hate to compress you know eighteen years into a few sentences, but I'll try and do it. <laughs> I, you really want my background. Uh, it started kind of at age three when my father kidnapped me from my mother. They had gotten divorced and uh, she moved me from Los Angeles to, to St. Louis. But when she arrived, her family, which she was one of five siblings, she was not terribly welcomed. And my father arrived there for his visiting Sunday and he said that I was a little bit unkept. And as I say in my book, he was feeling and not thinking and she was thinking and not feeling. So when he decided, instead of taking me to the movie, taking me back to Los Angeles, she didn't come after me because she said she wasn't welcome in her family. And she felt that maybe I was better off with him, even though legally, you know, I was basically given to her by the courts. Uh, mm. She got custody in the courts. My father didn't even show up for the divorce. Anyway, dad and I spent the next two years together, part time. He was a radio operator aboard a ship. And uh, so I spent half the time with with uh, neighbor, neighbors and the other half of my father. And we were sort of buddies during that period. Then World War II broke out and he was either drafted or volunteered into the merchant service as an officer. And I spent the next five years in five different Catholic foster homes and five different Catholic schools, which uh, they, they, they ranged from the first one was pretty awful, kind of Dickinsonian, uh, you know, abusive. I wasn't Cinderella, but I, I sure as heck wasn't welcomed. In those days, people took on people like me for basic for the, for the income. And um, the last family, which I only spent six months with, were really spectacular and really set up uh, an example of what a family would be like. I, fortunately or unfortunately, my father came back after the war and wanted me to come back to live with him. And I flew across country alone, which was shocking in those days, a five stopper from Los Angeles to New York. When I got there, he really... I guess felt that he wasn't that excited about seeing me. Anyway, we spent the summer in the in the YMCA on 34th Street, and he was looking for land-based work. And I was basically learning the subways at age 10, romping around. Uh, when it came time for school, we had to find a place to live. So we moved to Coney Island and lived in a hotel room, a uh, room and a half in Coney Island. And I went to a local public school, PS 106, now, Dad had a bad year, but I had a pretty good year. PS 106 was a good school. Come the summer, he'd given up on land-based work and decided to go back to sea. And he had basically arranged for a woman to take care of me during the summer of 47. 
And just before he was going to leave, she changed her mind. And I spent part of that summer alone in a hotel room, which, uh, you know, had learned the subways the previous summer. So I, I spent time watching giant baseball games, going to museums and libraries and things like that. But at 11 years old, it was quite, I guess, quite a quite an experience. Come the school year, uh, this woman was supposed to take me, but she wouldn't. And he ended up putting me in a, in a, in a Jewish orphanage uh, in Farakaway. And I spent the next three years there. I traded my one and a half rooms in the hotel for a, a room with 50 other boys in it, with uh, traded my closets for a, a chair, on, uh, basically a drawer under my bed. Uh, at that orphanage, I aged out around the age of 14, 15. At that point, my father completely disappeared. And uh, I didn't find out why he did that until 2015, when some papers came to the University of Rochester and wow. some librarian noted the, the, the reasons. It's a long story, so I'll leave it out. Anyway, I became a ward of the state and some very nice social, social, uh, social worker, instead of putting me in a, uh, in a home for wayward boys, she sent me to another really fine orphanage in Yonkers, New York, that had a close high, a high school close to it. And at that point, my life really turned and I decided my way out of this whole problem was a private college education. And I put my shoulder to the, the wheel and uh, got good grades and uh, made up my mind I was going to go to a private college. And luckily, I got an NROTC scholarship as a senior and enrolled in the University of Rochester. It was my last choice. I really wanted to go to Cornell, which I was accepted, or RPI, which I was accepted. But the Naval Scholarship required a certain amount of academic efforts. And those required, that basically pushed out the engineering education from four years to five years. Rochester said they'd get me through in four. So I went to Rochester not knowing anything about it, but it turned out to be a great experience. It was a perfect school for me. So that's the first 18 years. I was in about 15 or 20 different locations and people say, isn't that horrible? It was, but those disadvantages became advantages for me. Uh, when you move as much as I did, you become adaptable and you almost, uh, you almost look forward to change. Uh, I always kid about it, but Going from one schoolyard to the next, you, you learn an awful lot. And by the third schoolyard, you're pretty professional in adjusting to a, a new situation. And that carried on to my later years when I felt I was willing to almost do anything in the business world. When people wanted somebody to take on a tough assignment, I took it on because I really enjoyed the idea of change and challenge. It, my early life had a lot of negatives, but it gave me this adaptability. It gave me resilience. It gave me perseverance. And later on, it gave me empathy. And then finally, it's given me an enormous amount of gratitude for what's happened to me since then. So those disadvantages became advantages. There were some still disadvantages, which, you know, stayed with me, like anger. You never quite get over being angry as a young person, because you see always kind of saying, why me? And I've had to fight anger all my life. I luckily have directed it uh, toward going, getting ahead rather than at other people. I've directed it internally or externally. I was to trying to figure out how I was able to do that, but it really helped me in getting ahead. That's a long answer to a short question, Trace. I'm sorry, but <laughs> it's kind of a long story. No, that's that's perfect. That's perfect. I, um, you know, I'm sitting here listening to your story, and I'm like, I've heard this story before, and I'm racking my brain trying to figure out how I've heard this story before. Um, I mean, I don't know if you know. I don't know. I must have heard it on another podcast or something, but I'm like, gosh, this story sounds so, so familiar. Um, well, the, the one part I left out is my father, when he kidnapped me, a few weeks later told me my mother had passed away and she had died. I was just about to ask about that. And, uh, you know, it's in the book, but, you know, I didn't find her until I was uh, for 57 years. I finally found her. That's a that's the latter part of the book. Oh, that's good. I mean, you know, that's awful that you had to go basically your whole life without her. Um, but it's such a blessing that you were able to find her in the end. No, it's interesting because you, you, you think you're only your, all you have is a reference to your father. You think you're all your father, but you realize you're enough different from him. That there's something else in there. When I met my mother, I realized I was, you know, at least half my mother and, you know, that basically made me recognize who I am or better understood who I was. A little late in the game, but still necessary. Absolutely. It's never too late to figure out who you are. You know, Ed, so you had a, 
a very tumultuous childhood to say the least. Um, and, and, you know, kids that go through such traumas like you've been through can either go down one of two paths, basically, you know, they, they either do what you did and say, okay, my only way out is education or they go down the other road. So, you know, what really helped you to uh, make that decision that I don't want to go down the road of, um, being a criminal or anything like that. I want to go down this road and go to college and be educated. Well, that's one of the reasons I've decided to move ahead with the book. I was just going to write it for my family, but many people said to me, you've got some lessons here that you can pass on to young people. The biggest lesson I took, but there's two big lessons. One is anything is possible. You know, I was, I was also quite diminutive. I luckily have grown a little bit, but as a child, uh, you know, when I was 10 years old, I weighed 66 pounds. And I was four and a half feet high. When I entered high school, I, was, I wasn't even five feet. And I didn't weigh 100 pounds. So I had a lot of disadvantages. So anything is possible. If this character can do it, anybody can do it. The second thing is I found out and that you just don't be a victim. Look ahead. Use the energy that people use in being victims to figure out what's next and go after it. But to, add, to really answer your question, uh, you know, what caused me to do it? A number of things. First of all, my father, given his, you know, given his problems and the poor man lost everything in 29 through 33, everything, including his mother, which he was very close to. And then he married a woman that didn't get along with him. So he had a very tough life, but he loved me very much. He gave me unconditional love. And he, he you know, even though we didn't see much of each other during the first 18 years, every letter in it that he wrote was boosting me, saying that I was a great person and I would do well. And he kept positive reinforcement. That coupled with the Catholic schools, Catholic schools were, in those days were very simple. If you did right and you were a good person, you would get ahead. If you didn't, <laughs> it wasn't so good for you. I mean, they really had good solid rules and the nuns were very tough. I, I learned the golden <laughs> rule with the golden ruler. I mean, they exactly. were tough, <laughs> but you learned from them. Then of course, the other thing that, you know, some kids don't catch on to, in that era, the movies, all the good guys always won. You know, John Wayne and Clark Gable, you know, Jimmy Stewart, in those movies, those guys, and also even on the radio, there was, yeah. you know, Terry and the Pirates, Jack Armstrong, those, they had serials in the afternoon, and the good guys always won. So you kind of wanted to be a good guy because you could win that way. So those were three or four things that sort of pushed me in the right direction. Uh, you know, I, I, did, I did have this one family when I was 10 years old that gave me a picture of what a family could look like. They were really good people. They were nice people. They treated me like their son. And so that was an example. I guess I had the ability to pick up the right things about people. And that helped me an awful lot too. But it was all those things in my childhood that, that, that helped me a lot. A lot of kids go down the wrong path because they become victims and they basically take it out on the world. And you can't do that. You got to say, well, I've had a bad break, you know, and what's next? What can I do to better myself? And always have the idea that in America, anything is possible. And that's been proven so many times, uh, you know, but it's not easy. I, 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 you know, sometimes I worry that, I, that I'm the, the exception rather than rule, but I don't think so. And I, I, that's why I'm pursuing this book. And I've talked to you know, a number of colleges and secondary schools and, and have really good responses from young people saying, yes, you've inspired me. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to do it. And that gives me a great deal of satisfaction and really confirms my conviction. This was a good idea. I think it's a fantastic idea. Um, I, I know that I have started to read your book. Um, I haven't finished it, but I have started to read it. Um, you know, and, and in your book, you talk about the four Ps. Can you tell us about those? Well, yeah, you know, I, I feel the ones, the only one constant in your life, and it's your inner voice. Your parents, you know, they're there at the beginning, they're not there at the end. You know, even your spouse is, your inner voice is something that's very important. And that's, again, it's answering your previous question. I really believe very strongly that you have to have a, a language that you use with your inner voice and it should be as simple as possible and it should have parts in it that you can go back to and reference. And so I developed, when I was at the University of Rochester and chairman of the board of trustees, I developed a, a speech that I gave, which was called the four Ps. Find your passion, which is an over, over word, overused word, but basically find out what really excites you. Find out what makes you take two steps at a time. And passions do change. In high school, my passion was math and science and baseball and basketball and girls. And, you know, when I got to college, it morphed. 
into engineering. And actually in my junior year, it changed again into, I founded a humor magazine and I put 30 people together to produce this magazine. And I proved my passion, which I didn't know at the time, was really putting people together to create either a new product or program or, or, or a new system. And that's what really excited me. But, you know, your, 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 your passions change. You should watch them, but find them. And if you find your passion, you really, and do what, you, you, do what your passion tells you to do, you'll never work. So that's the most important thing. Second thing, maybe it's not. Maybe principles are the more important, but find your principles. Find those lines that you won't cross. Find the rules you want to live by, because when life gets difficult, those people go down the wrong path, they come to those lines and they cross them. Because early on, they didn't establish that those are lines they wouldn't cross, or those are things they wouldn't do. And you start off with the golden rule, you know, do unto others. And over, all through my life, I used to put these, these quotes on my board, things that I would follow, because there would be basically principles that I would follow. And it's very important to have those principles. You know, my last principle, I'll skip over it, is gratitude. You know, I really believe that the most important principle in my life at my age is giving back and gratitude to people, thanking people, thanking everybody that helps me. Thank you, Tracy, for having me on your program. <laughs> so establish your principles. And, and the principles are, come from religion, they come from your parents, and they come from yourself. You can get them from books. I did. I didn't have a, a real founding in religion myself. I thought I was Catholic, but I guess I wasn't. And as soon as I found out I wasn't, I still I started to have to establish my principles. But there's so many ways of doing that. And there's also examples of people who you can take and say, these people are somebody I want to be like. Third one is find your partners. I've found that I'm only as good as the people who surround me. And I start off with, you know, P1, as I call her, my spouse, your, your <laughs> real partner in life. You can find a partner in life that, you know, you can support, that will support you, that you can, you know, help and who can help you, who can basically be, be your friend forever, who really thinks you're important, you think she or he is important. So I think that's the most important thing and who will follow you all through your life. I've been married now for, for 56 years. And without Barbara, you know, I wouldn't be where I am here today. That's the most important thing. But in everything you do, you need partners. I always kid about this in my job. So I always try to find people, establish the task. Then I found people that could do things that I can't do that have to be done. Then I found people who can do things better than I can do them. Then I found people that actually who could do things that I do, but I don't want to do. So mm -hmm. if I get those three kinds of partners, I end up doing things that I do well that I want to do. And so it's an interesting collection. And your partners in each job are different. When I was in the company, you hire certain kinds of people to surround yourself with. When I was chairman of the board of trustees of a university, which was a, you know, a nonprofit or an elite mercenary organization, you surround yourself with different kinds of people. People do different kinds of tasks. So partners are very important. And then finally, plans. I believe very, you know, a senior, one of the universities I talked to asked me, what's the one thing you can tell me to do? And it's, it's very hard to answer, but it's one thing. And I said, write down your plans. Write down what you want to do and how you think you're going to do them. Even though plans changed, if you have a plan, at least you can go back to it and figure out why and how you're going to change it. I mean, God, God said, God plans, man plans and God laughs. I, that's a famous expression. And it's true. But I always find this, I write my plans, and I do it almost once a year, and I revamp them. And I say, this is what I want to do. And I say, well, this didn't work. Why did it work? But writing down things really is a very important exercise, because thinking is very fuzzy. You can barely remember what you thought. Oh, yeah. Speaking is pretty fuzzy, too, unless you have somebody who really listens to you, and very few people really listen. But when you write it down and you look at it, it's good. And I also think then, when you write things down, you have to take into consideration what I call context. What period of history are you living in? What are the major things that are going to happen? And how can you take advantage of them? Find a wave or a cycle or a theme or something you want to do. If you can ma marry a theme to your passion, you really have one of the answers to life. You know, I really enjoyed, after I left engineering, the financial world. And I caught a theme from 1980 to 2000 all the markets of the world did very well, and I was involved in it. So the wind was at my back. Now, you don't necessarily want to have to have the wind in the back or want to have your wind in the back, but it really helps. You find out that most successful people 
take more credit than they deserve, including me, for their successes. <laughs> but most of them have the wind at their back. They, they find something that you know works, they get involved in it, and the wind carries them. My company grew almost 20 fold, 20 times in 20 years. Uh, but during that time, the stock market went up 10 times. So I'd added a little something to it, but I had the wind at my back. So, so that's that third one is that plans. Think about your context. I, I always use the example of the difference between when my father was born in 1900. From 1900 to 1970, if you study that period of history, it was a really tough period. You had the Spanish flu, the First World War. You had a good few year, good years in the 20s, but they were a little crazy. Then you had a depression. Then you had a Second World War. After the Second World War, if you read the books, it wasn't such a great period. And the 70s weren't great. So in many respects, he was born at the wrong time. I was born at the right time. The last 40 years, ex some really bump, big bumps have been pretty damn good. So that's that little four Ps. And you can have your you can add your fifth P, which is if you get the four Ps right, you end up with the most important P, which is purpose. It'll give you purpose if you exercise your passion, find your principles, surround yourself with good partners and build some plans that take you in the right direction. So it sounds, you know, to me, I, I try to develop something simple so that when I go back and talk to myself, which is embarrassing, but I do it, uh, I can go back and look at these four things and say, am I exercising my passions? Have my passion changed? Am I keeping my principles? Do, and by the way, my book tells you very clearly, when I had the right partners, I succeeded. When I had no partners or the wrong partners, I failed. And that, you know, mm -hmm. and again, plans. Every job I took on, I took time to write down a plan. Because once you get into the war, you, you know, you have to go back and look and see what, what you're thinking about doing when you when something comes up. So, so I think those four things are fun. I've had a lot of people respond to me on them. They've used them. One, one young lady used them as a, P, as a, a, a PhD uh, a paper to, get, to get, it, get her PhD going, and she got a good grade on it. So, so that was pretty happy. I'm pretty happy with that. But it's fun. You can develop your own four or five things that you want to base on. You know, there are other things that, that may be more important to you than the four Ps, but I think that covers pretty much everything for me. I mean, that's fantastic. I, I think those four Ps are, um, they're crucial. And well, my I second know. book will be my second book will be an expansion. The four P's are described in my epilogue of this book. The second book, which is already written, will be an expansion of the four P's. I want to really go into it in depth. And okay, it's an sounds. allegory about a, a man and a young boy traveling through the four P's with four villages that they go to, and each village it has its own characteristics, and they talk during the entire time. So it's it'll be fun if if I get the second book out. You mean when you get the second book out? Let's think positive here. <laughs> Let's add another piece to the list. Positivity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and as far as talking to yourself, you don't have to be embarrassed by that. We all talk to ourselves. You only have to be embarrassed when you're doing it out in public, out loud, and you're arguing with yourself. No, no, it's a, it's a, it's a, <laughs> conversation. It's a conversation with the inner voice. And usually you do it with, with a pencil in your hand. It really works pretty well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I have to do that myself all the time. I, I call it a staff meeting, but, you know, um, so, you know, Ed, thank you so much for coming on. This has been awesome. Uh, I, I actually, it makes me really want to just end my day and go back in, on, onto the couch and dive back into your book and, and finish reading it. So, you know, thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing your story and, you know, just letting us know that it, you know, it doesn't matter where you started. What matters is, you know, what, what you do with it and and where you go from from there from the beginning yeah. you know I, i'll give you a statement don't let the beginning define the end oh i love it you love that i love that i, I got love that, that. Young man in one of my lectures i'm getting so much fun because i'm i'm getting almost more than i'm giving young people <laughs> they're so wonderful but the book the i appreciate if you do read the book you give tracy give me a little note on whether you liked it or not and if oh, you really absolutely. Liked it, Please go to Amazon. Give me a little rating. Of course, my I will. publisher says make sure you tell everybody that makes them happy. People give the ratings <laughs> and a little brief review. Amazon, you'll see how you can do that very easily. So Sounds thank you good. for having me on. It was fun. Absolutely. Um, and how can we find you online? Uh, you can. I have a website, and because the name Hagem is all by itself, it's just www.edhagem. Okay. And it's got all kinds of good stuff on there. I have seven principles, which I use, one of which is gratitude. And uh, talks about, it, it develops some of the other 
thesis that I'm working on. And also some of the media presentations that I, that I did that was set up by my young lady who took care of you, got you involved with me. She's developed a really good website. So I'm happy with that. And that shows you how to order the book there as well. So perfect. We sold a bunch of books. I'm, I am shocked how many books we've sold. So we're pretty happy about that. And I'm just, I'm going to keep going till they stop selling. So <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. And I'm, so I, I am donating. There'll be no profit. The, the publisher gets most of the money, but oh yeah, I'm donating any pro, proceeds to my scholarship programs. I think that's the one message I might leave last is that make sure in your life you include, there are four parts of life. Let me take another minute. Self, which you have to solve early on between ages, beginning and age 25 or 30. Then is family, which lasts most of your life. Work or business, which you basically spend too much time on. And then community, which is giving back. And then giving back is so important. It has much more satisfaction in giving back in some of the business things that I did. And in giving back, you're contributing to things that are going to be here for a very long time. Uh, three of the four companies I worked for and did wonderful things for are all gone. You know, they've either gone bankrupt or gone out of business or been merged out. But the University of Rochester, where I'm involved, is going to go on. All my scholarship students are now, you know, doing their best and so forth. So giving back is important. You don't have to give back a lot. Whatever you give back really will pay dividends. I, I find that I get much more than I give when I give back. Oh, absolutely. I, I can't agree more with that. Well, Ed, thank you again for coming on the show. This has been awesome. Well, Listener, listeners, you know the drill. You know I will have all of Ed's contact information over in the show notes. If you're listening from one of our partner stations, just head over to releasingtraumapodcast.com, pull up Ed's show, all his contact information, link to his book, everything will be there for you. And I want to thank everybody for reading, if you do read my book, because I'm really intimidated by bookstores. To find out how many how many books there are. <laughs> <laughs> there is definitely a lot of books, and it's so much easier to get published nowadays than it yep. was, you know, 10, 20 years ago. So well, thank you. And you know, listeners, like Ed mentioned, if you do read his book, make sure you go over to Amazon and leave him a review so that his publisher will be happy. She is a very sweet girl. <laughs> so thank you for listening. And as always, we'll talk to you in the next show. Yeah, Tracy, have a wonderful holiday season. Take good care. Thank you, Ed. You too.